So I am Teresa Mangum. I'm the director of the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies. And thank you all for coming today for a series we call Get It Done. And in this series, we tend to focus on one skill or one um, professional habit or possibility. And we think of these as quite informal. So I'll introduce our two guests today and then um, get them to start us off telling us a bit about in this case, how they're working with agents. But I warmly welcome all of you who are here to drop questions in chat, just to speak out into the space. Um, we're very informal in these events and happy to have you fully participate. I also want to thank Jennifer New, our Associate Director, for organizing and inviting Carrie and Gigi to join us today. Um, Manakshi Gigi Durham is a class collegiate scholar and, and a professor in journalism and mass communications and in the Department of Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies. Gigi also serves part-time as the University of Iowa Ombuds. Um, her most recent book is Me Too, The Impact of Rape Culture in the Media from Polity in 2021. And she, her, uh, and she has a number of books, but another book um, she published earlier, Lo The Lolita Effect, she worked with a commercial publisher, Outlook Press, so she also brings that experience to the conversation. Carrie Shuttlepelts is an associate professor of practice in the School of Planning and Public Affairs. From, nine, from 2009 to 2016, Carrie had several different jobs um, as a policy advisor on homelessness in Washington, D.C., including under the Obama administration. Carrie has an MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's a trained storyteller and teaches digital storytelling at various levels. She's also currently working on a book about tribal enrollment that intertwines personal narrative interviews and data collection. And Carrie is an enrolled member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, my home state. So to start us off, um, Carrie and uh, Gigi, well, Carrie, we can start with you. I know people would just love to hear about when, when you're an academic in the past, you've basically sent off book proposals to all sorts of academic presses. They mysteriously go to an editor and you get invited to submit a manuscript or very often to not to submit a manuscript. And then your book goes out to readers. But um, most of us have not had the experience of having that intermediary of an agent, uh, though many more people are doing so. So it would be wonderful, Carrie, if you'd start us off talking about how you made that decision and how that process works. Sure. Um, and I should say that all of the stuff before getting an agent I'm, that Teresa just mentioned. I'm sorry, I'm listening to a webinar. Okay. It's the okay. one Teresa is sponsoring. Um, I think somebody's got their, <laughs> needs to mute. Oh, it's Jane. Hi, Jane. I'm going to mute you. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So I should, I should just say um, everything that you mentioned, Teresa, before getting an agent, I've never done. So um, the sending stuff out to, to academic publishers and things, um, I don't know anything about that. Um, I, in a lot of ways, I'm not a traditional academic. Um, and so, um, you know, I come from the practitioner's world. And so when it came time for me to think about uh, books and I was trained as a fiction writer, I should also mention. Um, so I've dabbled a little bit in the fiction process of getting an agent. Um, and that was an epic failure for me. And so I began to think about um, how could I write nonfiction, which is becoming and, and sort of became the thing I really wanted to do. Um, and so I had this idea. I, I had always been, I had always sort of been asking this question, which was, um, it started off in graduate school. The first time around, I went to the Kennedy School for my graduate work in public policy, um, took a really great class with Robert Putnam, who, um, kind of coined social capital. And in his class, we were encouraged to ask questions of data. And one of the questions I was asking was, why is it that over the years we have seen an explosion of people who self-identify as native? Um, and yet the numbers <laughs> aren't supported by birth, death, 
a sudden parachuting of new humans onto the earth. I mean, there's just nothing that can explain it. Um, and so the question really became what, what is driving this? Um, that was 15 years ago. <laughs> um, and only recently within the last couple of years, I've been sort of resuscitating that research question. I was wholly unfamiliar with the process of how to query a nonfiction book. In the fiction world, you write a book <laughs> and then you send it to an agent and they read the book. So that's sort of the process that I was familiar with. Um, as I soon learned, and thanks to a lot of colleagues here at the University of Iowa, um, many of whom went to the nonfiction writers program um, and had had some training on the you know, professional side of things, how to, how to do all of this. Um, one of them was kind enough <laughs> to share with me a proposal template, which was, again, a document I had never seen before. I was not familiar with it. Um, it was really useful, though, to just see what goes into a book proposal. Um, this wouldn't necessarily be for an academic book, because, again, I can't really speak to that side. The book that I'm writing is part research, but also part literary nonfiction and memoir. Um, so it's a slightly different path. Um, once I got a hold of the proposal, though, I was able to sort of <laughs> to make it my own. And so I could just fit my work into the proposal. Um, I ended up sending the proposal to agents who I had met before, um, which I think is sort of a, a big difference from sending it into the ether. Um, and in fact, I did a, a little social experiment when I was doing this process, which was I sent the book proposal to 10 agents that I had met or had contact with. And then I sent it to three who I'd never met and just found their email addresses on the internet. And I can tell you that none of the three responded and all 10 of the others did. <laughs> now, I don't know that that's a representative sample of anything, um, but I do think it goes to show that sometimes it is easy to get stuck in that pile. And I've heard this from other writers too. Um, where did I meet agents? Well, I met them through um, my own MFA program, uh, which had brought agents through in the two years that I was there. And then fortunately were willing to connect me with agents who had come through the program since then. Um, I also had had contact with agents at different writers conferences. And so these are generally, you know, sort of two week programs over the summer where writers converge on a place and then they bring in agents and publishers and editors. Um, so that's sort of how I had met them. It's not to say that I knew them. <laughs> it's just to say that I could say in my email, hey, we met at X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think that sometimes that has the proxy effect of them saying, okay, they're not just some person off the street. They have some form of credential. I think your job title could just as easily do that for you, right? I mean, if someone knows that you're a professor of such and such. Um, but for me, that was sort of my way to proxy that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, once I send it out, um, I, I think I'm somewhat lucky that my topic for this particular book is something that a lot of people are starting to be interested in um, and felt relevant to people. And so I was able to meet with a bunch of agents, um, kind of narrowed it down based on just the conversation we had over Zoom, um, which isn't the best way to do it, I suppose, but COVID. So had a lot of Zoom conversations with people. Um, the way that I ended up choosing the person I chose was um, I felt that the conversation we had was more driven by content rather than the business. Um, and as someone who is a true like country mouse myself, having grown up in Iowa, um, I'm not particularly comfortable talking about publishing. I don't know anything about it. And so I would prefer just to talk about the content and what I'm thinking. Um, and so I found someone great who was willing to have that conversation. And then I sort of looked at their other clients. I mean, I think that's a natural process too, is to sort of, and, and they're not shy, right? Any agent will have a website that promotes all of their clients. And so looking through who else they represent, 
or these people who you've read, who you respect, who might be doing similar things you're doing. Um, and that was the case. And so um, that's how I, how I chose my person. Um, right now we're working to get the book proposal exactly where we want it to be. It's been a six month process. <laughs> um, no, I don't have a completed book. I have two chapters and I have chapter summaries for all the rest, which is, as I understand it, what publishers wanna see. And um, so our goal is January, wish us luck. And um, that's been sort of the process so far. So that's kind of what I know. Um, Teresa, I don't know if I touched on everything you wanted me to touch on. Yeah, that was fascinating. And I have many questions and I bet others do too, but I'll ask Gigi first to share her experience and then we'll open it. Um, Cause I know that they're varied and you're coming out of different contexts. So if you wouldn't mind Gigi, I'd love to hear about your experience with agents. Sure. Um, and it was really interesting hearing about Carrie's because mine is in so many ways the opposite. <laughs> I mean, completely the opposite. Um, because uh, I, you know, when I published my first book, I was, you know, a, a PhD and in an academic program. And my first book was an academic um, publication. And so I went through the stages that you talked about, Teresa, you know, developing the proposal, sending it to, you know, and, and it was through an acquisitions editor that I'd met at a conference. And, but, you know, it was a fairly standard kind of, um, approach to academic book publishing. And I know several people here have done that. So, um, but then um, I decided, and the reason I did this was, you know, because I'm also a feminist media scholar and I take feminism very seriously. Uh, and I felt like I wanted to engage with, you know, people outside of academia. I wanted this to have more of an impact. You know, I wanted people to read it and um, read my work and, and understand it. And I wanted to, it to make some sort of progressive change. That was my hope. Um, I'm a former journalist though. Um, I am, you know, I, I have been a, a reporter and, a, and an editor for newspapers and magazines. And so before I, you know, before I came to academia, I was very used to sort of writing for a general public. I was, you know, I could, you know, craft a catchy lead and, um, you know, I knew how to drop in quotes and drop in, you know, sort of uh, references to experts and research and in a, in a long form feature story. So I, I already had a skills at writing um, in a different register, if you will, from the scholarly mode. Um, so, and I also knew a bit about book publishing, uh, even for a general audience. And I knew that in order to sell a book or pitch it, you know, to a major publisher, that for the most part, you had to have an agent because a lot of major publishers won't even look at a book, at a manuscript um, that isn't submitted by an agent. Um, and the reason for that is that the agent has vetted it. Um, so they know that whether they know that it's, um, if it comes from an agent, they'll know that it's a, a good fit for their list and the type of thing that they typically do publish and B that it's in a stage ready to be published, right? So the agent kind of, um, you know, sort of in a sense um, guarantees the publisher that it's gonna be something that they would want to look at. Um, so, but then, I, you know, again, my, my, my position was the opposite of, of Carrie's in some ways because I, do not have an MFA. And I did not go to a program where, you know, I met agents. And even in my life as a journalist, I never really ran into any agents. So I didn't know anybody. So I did do the cold call method. You know, I did send my proposal to, um, to agents that I had had no connection with in the past. Um, where did I find the list? There are several places where you can look, like Poets and Writers has a list of sort of reputable literary agents. Um, uh, Writers Market, which is kind of a, you know, Bible with a small B for, you know, uh, freelance writers and um, that they list some agents. And so there are different places where you can actually um, find agents. You can even like read introductions and prefaces to books or sometimes acknowledges, acknowledgements where authors will um, thank their agent. So uh, there are different ways of figuring out like who you might want to pitch your, your book to. Um, and that's kind of what I did. I don't remember exactly how I find the, the ones that I pitched to, but I think it was from those sorts of lists. Um, and I was looking back through my notes. Um, so the books, you know, I, this is the Lolita effect, uh, the one that Teresa was talking about. And this was published by a commercial publisher, Overlook, and actually was pretty successful on the whole. Um, and this is my latest one, Me Too. And it's published by Polity, which is kind of a crossover press. And I didn't need an agent for that one. Um, but when I was pitching to, to agents, I sent them emails. Um, and I described the book first and asked if they would like to, to look at the proposal. 
Um, and I was looking back through my emails and I realized I was pretty lucky because I only sent it to three. And all three of them wrote back and said, yes, we would like to see your proposal. So, I mean, it worked sort of the opposite of Carrie's in the sense that I didn't know these people and they didn't know me, but they liked my pitch enough that they wanted to look at it. Um, and I actually just went with the one who came back first with a yes, which was Jennifer De La Fuente from um, Venture Literary. And then she left them and she started her own agency and I stayed with her and she just retired and closed it. So I'm actually in the market for a new agent. Um, but the, so that was that was my process um, to figure out how to write the proposal, which was I knew would have to be different from a typical academic book proposal. I consulted books and there are a lot of books out there on this subject. So even if you just, um, um, you know, like search on Google books about nonfiction book proposals, you'll find a whole bunch of them. I remember the ones that I used. One was by Elizabeth Lyons called Nonfiction Book Proposals Anybody Can Write. I also looked at a book called Write the Perfect Book Proposal. And then there was one more and it's the name, the title's escaping me now, but, um, but I think any of them are pretty good. They all sort of give you a basic idea of how to craft a good nonfiction book proposal. And then as Carrie said, once I did secure an agent, she revised the proposal with me. Um, she, she, she worked with me on um, rewriting it so that she, as she said, it looked like something that came from their agency. That, so they had a particular way that they wanted these proposals to be crafted. Um, and then she sent it out and, um, uh, it was picked up by by Oberlook Press, which is not a major press, but was great to work with. They did a wonderful job of marketing the book. Um, uh, you know, some of you will remember I was on all these TV shows and, you know, I ended up in a movie that was on the Oprah Winfrey Network. And like <laughs> they really did an amazing job of marketing this book, but also... Um, it, it, it reached the people that I wanted it to reach. I got, I got messages back from all sorts of people, you know, from teenagers, um, from feminists, from, you know, all kinds of people and parents and teachers. And, you know, it was really a wonderful, a wonderful thing to be able to, to reach that many people. Um, so, so that actually worked out very, you know, very nicely. Um, I'm trying to think if there's, oh, what I wanted to say about um, the press was, um, you know, it, it was the right press for me. And I think that, you know, that is really the thing to look at. Um, there are, you know, there are the major big presses that, and I think the big ones are really looking for, now there's like such an emphasis on having a platform. So like if you have a zillion Twitter or Instagram followers, I think you're more likely to attract a certain type of agent and a certain type of press. But there are others who are interested in like small thoughtful books that may not sell a huge number of copies, but that may be critically acclaimed or advance a position that the press is interested in. So I think some of it is just finding the right fit. Um, and I guess I'll leave it there and just try to answer questions as they come up. I hope that, that, that you know, that addresses most of the things you were thinking about, Teresa. Yeah. Can I, can I riff yeah. on something that Gigi said? Yeah. <laughs> um, because I really loved what you said about the audience. Um, and for me, and this is perhaps why my work differs from a more academic kind of publication. For me, it was so important to think about a wide net and the fact that I was writing this book for my mother, who's not an academic, you know, and, and so what is the appropriate process um, to get that through? But I think that that is such an important consideration is who do you want to read this book? Um, and then you can sort of work backwards and, and ask yourself, well, then what process do I take? And you both, um, you know, ha have probably unusually strong experience in training in writing for broader audiences as a creative writer, creative nonfiction writer, as a journalist. I suspect that people whose experience is only writing um, academic articles and books probably face, um, it's probably a, a, a much bigger leap to try to, to reach that point. I'm wondering if even, even though you all had experience, and then I'll jump to the, um, to the chat questions, but anybody also just let me know, just turn your camera and wave your hand or put your you know, little hand thing up. Um, but I'm wondering if there were things that surprised you about the kind of advice your agent gave you or what they insisted that you do to meet their um, expectations. I have a great one because it was so yucky to me and it actually came from someone I didn't choose. <laughs> I didn't choose her because of this. Um, and this kind of goes back to what Gigi was saying about platforms, um, which 
I, I like, I don't tweet, you know, I don't, I don't know what TikTok is. I don't do any of that. And so I was like, oh no, it's just never going to happen for me. And one of the agents I talked to said, um, because she knew I was sort of trying to go in a memoir place to a memoir place. And what she told me was that um, in order to, for her to be able to sell a memoir to a big publisher, um, either I needed what you were saying, Gigi, millions of Instagram followers or, and I quote, my father had to have killed my mother. And she said that because she had a client recently who wrote her memoir about her father killing her mother. And she said, it's that sort of moment that big publishers need in order to be able to sell a memoir. And I was just so exactly what Jen right now is doing, which is like allergic reaction away from the, that's exactly what I did. Um, and fortunately my current agent doesn't share that same opinion, but I do think there's a school of thought, um, where some of the agents you might talk to, um, especially if they work with a big agency like Wiley or, you know, one that's just massive, um, they're thinking in dollar signs and they're thinking about how am I going to market this to a publisher and how is a publisher going to market this to the audience. And that was what just completely turned me off from that conversation. Yeah, that's grim. That's very <clears throat> grim. Although, I mean, I do think it is that the question of marketing is probably one that if you want to write for broader audiences, you have to brace up, you know, you just have to have matter of fact conversations about. Yeah. I mean, I think what was interesting about that though, and never did we have this conversation was we never talked about the writing quality. Mm. We never talked about, you know, there's, there's certain things that didn't really factor into that. It was, it was almost all just the advertisement and the platform of the book. I've heard other agents say the thing about Instagram and Twitter and all of that. Um, my agent told me something that I thought was more helpful, um, which is the thing you really need to show in the proposal or whatever you're providing to publishers is why you need to be the person to write this book. And so it's less about 20 million people follow me on Snapchat and more about I am uniquely positioned to tell this story and to sort of have a voice in this discussion. I thought that was a lot more helpful. And that's really interesting because I would give that advice to anybody writing to an academic press, you know, a book proposal there too. Gigi, were there things that surprised you or that you found especially helpful in an uh, agent's mm -hmm. advice? Yeah, I have several responses to that. And even thinking about Carrie, I had some yucky moments too. Um, so I totally agree though with the idea that you do need to um, explain why you are the person to write this book. So your expertise does matter. Your previous publications do matter. I do think some of that was a factor in why uh, so many people were interested in the Lolita effect because prior to that I had published a number of academic articles about you know, this topic and I had some expertise in it. So, um, so I think that played in. Um, some surprises. One was I thought I was really good at writing for a general audience because I had been a journalist for so many years, but no, I mean, they, and so actually they really did pay attention to, to my, you know, to my writing, which even to them sounded a little too scholarly. I mean, I guess I had been in academia long enough that I, you know, so like when I first got into academia, I had to do that whole shift where I had to, you know, change my whole mode of writing and learn how to write in a totally different register for scholarly journals and academic publishers. And then now I had to you know, switch back. And it was uh, more of a challenge than I had thought it would be, you know, especially because I teach journalism writing classes and things. But, um, but my agent was great, you know, she really worked with me closely about that, and looked at my my prose and suggested things. And, and that happened even after the book was acquired, because my editor at Overlook was fantastic. And she really, and I never, we never had a lot of friction about that, you know, because I could see what they were doing. And there wasn't a point where I really dis disliked what they, well, I guess there were a couple of things I did dislike, but I, in many cases, I caved just because I wanted this to happen. Um, some of the yucky things that happened to me, um, one was, um, well, they really wanted it sort of more crafted as a self-help self-help book, which I was like re resisting a lot. I just didn't want to be in that genre. And they kept insisting and insisting. Um, and so at the end of every chapter, I put in sort of, you know, um, 
you know, what we can do, like practical guidelines or whatever, based on that chapter. And later, though, I, they were right. I got so many emails and messages from people saying, oh, we're so glad you have these suggestions at the end of the book, and they really helped me. And so, so I guess they knew the market better than I did. <laughs> they, were, they were right about that. Um, and then the other thing was, um, one thing that it still troubles me to this day, they didn't want me to use my full name. They absolutely resisted and rejected Meenakshi. They wouldn't. So if you look on the book now, it's, I don't know if you can see it, but at the bottom it says M. Gigi Durham. Like they would not let me use Meenakshi. And I hated that. And I was so upset about it. And they just, and it was kind of a deal breaker for them. And in the end, I did cave to that. I wish I hadn't. Um, because they said, oh, nobody will be able to spell it. Nobody will be able to Google it. Nobody will be able to find it. And, you know, now when I think about Tanahisi Coates and, you know, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and people like that, it's like, really, really? So, I mean, of course, there was some degree of racism and xenophobia involved there. And I also made up my mind after that, that I will but never, ever let anybody not use my full name. And so, yeah, this book has my full name on it. And I'm never, ever going to let anybody not <laughs> let me use it. So, so there was that. Um, and then... Uh, the last thing I wanted to say, you know, the thing about some agents like really demanding a platform and it just depends on like who you're working with. But but there are agents who are interested in, you know, small, thoughtful books that may not sell a huge number of copies. Right. But um, and like amazing things can happen. So just recently, this fabulous little book Rising about U.S. cities who are going underwater because of climate change was published by Milkweed Editions, which is a small press based in. Uh, Minneapolis that mainly takes agented work and it was a Pulitzer finalist last year so her agent found the right fit for her and that's the moral of that story I guess. <laughs> the, the point that you said earlier Gigi about um, I can't remember what reminded me of this but another oh it, the um, writing for a broader audience issue um, another thing in this, if you've looked at a book proposal template, you'll know that one thing they really want you to do is um, put comparative titles in it, right? So other books that are similar to your book in some way, whether it's the way it's written, the subject, et cetera. Um, but they also want you to explain why there's a, still a gap. Even with these other books, there's still a gap in this market that I'm trying to corner. Um, but I will say I found it really helpful to just, and this is like, you know, the number one advice you get for as a writer is read. Um, but I did find it really useful to just read a bunch of books. I basically tried to read every book that I could that was in any way related to what I was doing. Um, and that definitely gave me a better sense of the language portion, you know, how they were written um, and that sort of thing. And I'll just jump in and say the academic book proposal requires the same thing as those of you who've published academic books know. They also want you to identify uh, similar titles and where your book fits. So that's that's sort of the same. Yeah, I was thinking about how there are all these parallels, but the books they're interested in as comparisons are probably in different registers, um, which is really fascinating. Um, in the chat, people have asked a couple of questions. One that you started to answer, Carrie, um, is about how people pay for agents, how the finances work. And Carrie, you had said in your case, it's commission-based. I wonder yeah. if you could say more about what that means. Sure. So they take, uh, in the contract you sign, they uh, list a percentage of your advance that they'll take and then a percentage of your royalties that they'll take. The difference is that um, the advance is what the publisher gives you before you write the book. <laughs> um, and then if you outsell your advance, then you get royalties off of each book you sell. Um, but if you undersell your advance, you don't get those royalties, but the good news is you don't have to pay it back. <laughs> However, <laughs> it's possible that um, it changes the dynamic for, for your next book and for the conversation, the future conversation. I've, I've, I've heard a lot of friends who have done these sorts of deals um, have told me that a big advance is not always a better situation um, because it's a lot of pressure um, to sell that many books. Um, because even though you don't have to pay it off, if you don't sell that many books, it's an optics thing to the publisher, right? They don't want to lose money. Um, and so sometimes having 
a small or a medium size advance can actually be to your benefit, but you're, you don't pay your agent anything. Um, they get a, they get a commission off of what you sell and then any kind of like rights that you would do. So foreign rights, um, audiobook rights. Some people get like a movie, right? Right. When they sell the book. Um, so any of that kind of stuff, they also get a commission off of, but it's all sort of outlined in. I'll just add that there was a movie clause in my book, but that never went out. <laughs> Not yet. Sometimes that takes a long time to do. Still hoping. Still hoping. Um, Asha, you have your hand up. Jump right in. Yeah, thank you. Um, both uh, to Carrie and uh, Gigi for this uh, wonderful session and Teresa. So I, so it seems like there's a pretty new phenomenon of um, at least one academic press, Princeton University Press, offering agents when people um, work with them. And I wonder, um, you know, if you kind of have awareness of this happening in other presses. It seems like it's a way that the discipline of philosophy, at least, is trying to reach more, more, um, more sort of a broader audience. And so I don't know what that process looks like. I mean, I think it might be a reason to choose to work with one press rather than another. But it sounds like, you know, I, I just have no idea how that process works, where perhaps the proposal would be submitted to the press. And then if they choose it, then you have an agent with them, you know, or so I just I'm curious if anyone's heard about similar phenomena with other presses. I think my sense is that this is a pretty new, new thing. So if the purse, if the press is assigning you an agent, what is the agent doing? I think they do publicity. So I think it's an agent for uh, to arrange like talks in public, you know, so I'm a philosopher, so I'm talking about philosophy. So, you know. uh, oh, so that, yeah, that that's really interesting because that would be more like a speaker's bureau sort of agent mm -hmm. who would be setting up your, um, you know, opportunities for you to talk at bookstores and in festivals. That's really fascinating, but that would be more on the marketing side. But you're also raising a really interesting point that it, it feels to me like part of what's changed at many academic presses is that the editors used to be very interventionist. So it used to be that when you wrote an academic book, you got a lot of feedback from an editor. It wasn't, you know, you'd get your reader's comments, but the editor would play a big role in helping you think about which to use and what you wanted to change. And that's now, few presses offer that, um, you know, have the capacity to offer that kind of, of support. And I wonder if there is an increasing reliance uh, or there will be on agents because they're almost fulfilling that part of an editor's role in the past. And at the same time, there's such a sense that whereas before academic books went automatically to a thousand libraries, now you're lucky you know, if 250 libraries still subscribe um, to that immediate uh, purchasing list so that maybe at both academic and and commercial um, presses they're just they have to put a lot more energy into multiple kinds of marketing which is where all that pressure about platforms probably comes from too. Carrie you like you had a thought about that. Well I, I mean it's, it's not an informed answer to your question but um I think this really sort of raises the importance of making sure you understand what each person is going to do for you. Um, and so one of the conversations that I had with my agent, just because I've had friends who have learned this the hard way, um, is that some agents aren't interested in, for example, trying to place articles for you, right? Like they're not interested in reaching out to the New York Times and seeing if they'll let you do an op-ed. They're not interested and they just are going to sell your book. Um, whereas other agents are much more willing to do that kind of stuff. And so I think it really depends on what the person wants to do. Um, and to that same point, I mean, most, most publishers, they provide their own marketing team, um, but figuring out what they they're willing to do, I think is a really important conversation because you don't want to be stuck, like not having someone doing really that kind of really important work for you. 
Yeah, I'd agree. I'll just jump in on that and um, say that actually in my experience, my agent and the publisher worked really closely together. She was very interested in the marketing and she did do things like um, getting my op-eds and pieces placed in various news newspapers and things like that. And she worked with the publicity people from Overlook on that. So I guess these are good questions to talk to your, an agent about before you sign a contract. So it sounds like that just as, as a quick follow-up, so the literary agent might have highly varied responsibilities. So it's kind of um, really, that's something that each person has to look into to see what they do, right? It also depends on the size of their agency. I mean, if they're with like Wiley, they have their own marketing people there. And so it wouldn't, the onus wouldn't be upon your agent to do that. Um, whereas if they're at a small agency or even on their own, they're kind of a one person shop. And so they're gonna be doing a lot more of that work. Um, James Schwab had a question, but I'm not sure it's one that you all will be able to answer. He was uh, noting that he had had an agent um, or had worked with the commercial press um, a number of years ago and now is wondering uh, what would have changed. But I'm guessing neither of you has that long term experience. Well, I, I can. Oh, sorry, go. Go ahead, Gigi. Oh, I was just going to say, I don't have the long view, but I think the basics haven't changed very much in terms of crafting the proposal, pitching to an agent, and then, you know, letting them work with you to find a publisher. Those, those very basic things haven't changed. I think what has changed are some of the things that we talked about earlier, where they're looking for, in some, some of them are looking for a platform, or some of them are looking for, but, but I think in terms, others are actually just looking for expertise in the field. So you know, I don't think there's that much difference, really. Well, when you ask, when you mention a platform, specifically, what what do you, what do you mean by a platform? Social media or something? Yeah, that was that was kind of new to me, um, and that's what they were looking for. Social media. That's exactly what they were talking about. Um, uh, what what my agent Jennifer was saying, because you know she worked really hard to to sell the book. It took a little while, and when we did get rejections, she said, "Well, it's because you don't have." a million followers on Twitter, you know, but we found the right press eventually, so. I do also think there's um, something to be said for the fact that it's now super low barrier to reach out to agents with the internet um, and with just being able to quickly Google search who represents this person, who represents this, you know, send off the, and so I don't know, this is speculation, but I wonder if that means that agents, it's harder to get their attention because I would imagine that they have a lot more people reaching out to them since it's a simple email and I don't really know what the process would have been before that. Well, back then it was the US mail or UPS or something like that. I mean, it was, that was, you know, that, that last book was pre-internet. So, you know, this is partly a case of somebody some, you know, allegedly retired, I like to call myself, and teaching in the School of Public Planning and Public Affairs, in case Carrie had, she probably recognized the name. Um, but um, so, you know, this is the latest morphing of my career getting back into these waters. That's why I raised that question because, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, those communication mechanisms are very different um, now than. Back then, it was a phone call or sending something in the mail and waiting a few days for it to get there, and all that kind of thing. Um, but I, I, part of the reason I asked what you meant by platform is um, over the last eight and a half years, I've built up a blog that's topping about 32,000 subscribers. And I think that that should be persuasive in terms of a platform, at least. Yeah, it does sound like you've, you're headed in exactly the right direction. Would want to make that clear in a in a proposal. Um, something else that I am um, also really curious about. I wonder if people are also approaching agents through people who have agents. Um, I realize that you know I don't want to encourage everyone to now uh, write to Carrie and and Shishi and say, "Will you introduce me to your agent?" 
But um, but I, I wonder if, I mean, it sounds like going to writers conferences is one way to engage with agents, you know, sort of a ready-made uh, arena. But uh, is, is, the, is that an appropriate thing for people to do, ask someone with an agent to make the introduction if there's a logical connection? I, I think so. I mean, I think you have to be cautious about doing that because you have put the other person in a somewhat awkward position where they have to decide if they want to use that chip. Um, it probably also depends on where in the process they are. I mean, I would be more likely to reach out to someone who had had a book out with an agent um, versus someone who was still in the proposal phase um, because it feels like there's more at stake in the proposal. <laughs> you still need a lot from that person. Um, whereas if you have, if you know of someone who has a great agent, they put out their book already, I think it's probably worth a shot if, but to Teresa's point, if there's a meaningful connection, you know, if, if it makes sense to do that. Yeah. And, and to Gigi's point, AWP is also a great place to connect with people. And I will say, <laughs> um, I spoke at my MFA program a couple weeks ago, and I'm pretty sure I horrified them with this advice, but, um, but my personal advice <laughs> is it's, it's, you know, again, the email that you send to say to someone, we met at such and such is your way of helping them proxy. Oh yes. This is a person who is probably a good writer kind of knows what they're doing. I should at least look at their proposal. Um, it doesn't mean that you've had a 45 minute meaningful conversation with that person, right? And so if you have someone's business card that you got from AWP by going to the different booths, I think that's just as good, you know, and you can say we met at AWP. Um, but I do think that that kind of connection, it, as simplistic as this sounds, I do think that sometimes that helps get the foot into the door. Thank you. Um, do, uh, do people have other questions about the process? I wonder if there are times when you, uh, you all would think people don't need an agent. Yeah, there are. I mean, certainly academic publishers, you don't need an agent, you know, and often you can meet acquisitions editors at your um, scholarly conferences. And that's happened with my academic books that acquisitions editors have either talked to them at the booths, as Carrie was saying, or they've sought me out after, you know, I published a couple of books, they were interested in my work and I've gone, they've, they've emailed me before the conference and said, hey, can we have lunch or whatever, coffee. Um, I also see that there's a, a question in the chat but um maybe we should move to that next oh, but yeah, okay. first, and then, yeah and then not i mean there are, there are also small presses that don't require agents so you know there are, you can get your book published and there's also self-publishing which seems to be more and more of an avenue for people these days i've never done it but people seem to do it um, and in chat, Cindy um, Opitz asked um, how you all have grappled with on current pro projects with what I'll call ownership with regard to the editing process. So how do you think about creative control over your work once you've started to work with an agent or sold a manuscript to a publisher? A lot of discussions. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I think um, it's really important that your agent know who you are and what where you're coming from. Um, I, just as one example, um, my agent wasn't sure whether I was, um, using too many F-bombs in my book proposal. <laughs> and so one of the comments she had made was, do we need this one? <laughs> and she sort of made it throughout. And, um, it kind of took a conversation for us to say, what is it we're trying to achieve here? You know? Um, and so I think like line editing is one thing and it's definitely something that probably your agent is going to do multiple times. Um, but having a conversation and it's an iterative process, of course, having multiple conversations about what you're trying to do, um, can be really helpful. I've also found though, that usually she's right. <laughs> 
you know, I mean, like, yes, I feel really strongly about my creative ownership and all of that. Um, but I do think it's important to have an open mind, especially if you're working with people who have done this so many times that they probably have a better a read on, you know, what is the reader looking for? What is the publisher looking for? Now, working with an editor at a publisher is different. And I think that that probably has a little bit less um, flexibility, but that's where I think it's really important to have an agent who can also be your advocate, you know, and, and sort of step in and say, I know my client, this is what they're trying to do. Yeah, I would agree. There's a lot of back and forth and um, most of the time they are right, but there were, there were have been points where I really, really wanted to, to do it my way. And they, you know, I went out usually because I would explain why I felt so wed to a particular phrase or section of the book. And they they listened. It's, it, I mean, it was a good process overall because, because they were interested in publishing a high quality book and so was I. And so it worked. I put the same sentence in my proposal seven times, even though she, my agent <laughs> kept striking it out. <laughs> I think on the seventh time, she was like, okay, I, you know, I understand that you want this to be, you know, I, I think that really does speak to finding someone that, that you can work really well with. Other questions people have. Yeah, Nathan. Hi, thank you. This has been really interesting. I, I had actually a question a little bit related to um, Gigi mentioning that, you know, you don't need an agent to work with an academic press. Um, but I've been aware and I don't know, I don't know if how unusual this is, but of, you know, contributing to a particular series at Oxford University Press where some of the authors had agents and I didn't. And so it just sort of made me wonder because this is so un unusual to me, a, a sort of sense of like, well, is why is that? Now, one of the authors was not an academic. And so perhaps that was that it was just that that sort of gateway. But I, I wondered if in your experience, like is an agent a sort of uh, sort of open, open particular doors or, 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 or uh, manners of advocacy that you, you, you wouldn't otherwise have, even if you're working with an academic publisher? Well, so I've worked with academic publishers and non-academic publishers, and certainly the agent gets you access to non-academic publishers that you would never have without the agent. So, and they do advocate for you. Now with academic presses, I have never had to work with an agent. Um, you know, I've always just submitted my proposal directly and it's worked. And um, so I, I think, you know, perhaps if you're, if you've seen people who have agents um, and they're still publishing with an academic press, it may be because they're, they're not academics and they're just used to to working that way. Um, yeah, because when you when you work directly with an academic press, you know, if you should be so lucky as to have royalties, the agent doesn't get a cut of the royalties. So, and I was just gonna add when we were talking about contracts, um, in my experience, it's typically 15% for an agent, but I think that can vary somewhat, um, mm. you know, but, um, but yeah, so. Thank you. My agent um, represents a few folks who also do academic publications. And so um, my observation and in talking to her is that she represents them when they want to write a book that they want to sell to Penguin, you know, or Random House. Mm -hmm. um, and if they want to sell a book to a university press or something, she's not really part of that process. I don't know if that's typical, but. Um, I yeah, would say it is. That's exactly right. It's the it's the place of publication that requires the agent usually not, you know, it's not the author. Great, thank you. It's really interesting too, because I mean, I think one profound difference is most academic publishers have long assumed they will have to be subsidized to function. And they understand, you know, most universities provide some funding to their academic presses because it's seen as providing a certain kind of service to the larger intellectual community where trade presses, they, they expect profit um, as a way, you know, as their business model. And of course, more and more academic presses now are trying to subsidize their academic books by also publishing trade books. Our own University of Iowa Press is certainly, you know, following that, attempting that model. But I'm guessing that makes the role of the agent even more kind of interesting 
um, since that feels more like a continuum at an academic press than an either or. And I wonder if that's if that's a new and different role for, for, for some agents is trying to find those different spaces, even uh, in academic as well as trade, you know, conventional trade presses. I think it'd be interesting, Nathan, to, um, so your, your collaborators who had agents, I think it'd be really interesting to get their names and go to their sites and just get a sense for what they're representing, you know, I mean, I would be fascinated to know, I don't know the answer to this, but perhaps there are agents that really cater to the academic publishing stuff. I don't know, but I would wonder maybe who these agents are that are representing those folks and what else they do. Um, and it makes you also wonder if, um, um, if the, the role of the agent in these cases might not be on commission, given that an academic book is not likely to make much money unless it's a rare breakout book. And instead, that might be a fee for service kind of a relationship um, so that the, the, the agent would help you to develop your proposal and, and identify the right press, but, but might not might expect that you'll pay them. Yeah, that'd be interesting to know. Um, Jennifer New just tucked in uh, the chat also that, as some of you may have heard, there's this wonderful new literary organization and space in town called Porch Light. Um, and Porch Light is having uh, a reading and Carrie will be featured reading from the book draft that she's working on now, The Indian Card. And that's tomorrow night. Uh, at Porch Light, and somebody could probably tell us that address at 7 p.m. Where, what is the address for people who might like to go? Uh, it's, let me see here. It's at the very end of Washington Street, 1019 East Washington Street. Thank you. And online, it looks like such a beautiful space, too. Um, anyone else have questions or, or any additional thoughts, Carrie or Gigi, that you'd want to share? Um, I just, I guess I just want to say that for me, it was very worthwhile working with an agent who really believed in me and really believed in my work and, you know, was working very hard to get a contract and all of that. You know, of course, there's something in it for them financially, but I think she really had a commitment to the work itself and that was rewarding. I went to um, a session many years ago through the Iowa Writers, um, what's it called, festival or the summer thing that they do. <laughs> um, and it was in the basement of uh, Midwest One Bank downtown. There were like seven people in the audience and it was Marlon James who was speaking, who has since become a Penn Faulkner. Where he he wrote this fantastic book called A Brief History of Seven Killings. Um, and he was saying how he sent his, uh, his draft of that book to 78 agents before he got one. And, um, and it went on to, I mean, you can, if you haven't read it, it's fantastic, but it went on to win all these awards and um, and that was a really good thing for me to hear <laughs> because I think in the process of trying to query agents and get anyone to pay attention and respond, um, it, for me, it felt a little bit demoralizing. <laughs> and so, um, and so I think it's just good to know that that's just the process, you know, it takes a long time sometimes and you may have to send it to 78 people <laughs> and, um, and it's typically nothing personal. Um, and so that was something that I tried to keep in mind. Thank you, Carrie and Gigi. And there's one other question. What does the university receive, if anything, from your book profits? And I can tell you it is not treated like an invention. And so it's yours. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I actually asked the provost office when I got my fairly modest advance and they said not to worry about it. They were only interested in multi-million dollar patents. And so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, alas. And I would also, you know, point out to people that uh, if you haven't yet published an academic book, 
have very modest expectations. There are many 30 cent royalty checks being sent to people 20 years after books are published when that two, those two books a year above uh, are sold. But every once in a while, if you hit the right topic and you hit the right note and, and uh, you can you know, get lucky and that could be very different. But uh, our, I think when you write academic books, you have a smaller group of colleagues in mind as your audience and graduate students. And what's really exciting about this session is also being reminded that a lot of the topics we write about for academic presses, there probably for many of us would be a way to reshape that idea, to just think about being more open and accessible in our use of language and um, to envision a broader audience that, that we might welcome into the way, things that we're thinking about. So I appreciate the inspiration to do just that. And let's thank Carrie and Gigi for a great session. Thank y'all. so. Much.